Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of Lent as Second Baptist Church. As we lean in for this moment of worship together, I want to share with you a brief story from a friend of mine that has been especially moving, confirming, and clarifying for me in recent days. But before I do that, I want to go ahead and share with you some announcements about upcoming opportunities that we have in community and discipleship and worship as Second Baptist Church. First of all, we've been so excited to have new friends who have been checking out and engaging with our church over the past year. It's been an unexpected gift. And if you're one of those new friends, we'd love to get to know you more and for you to get to know us better as well. And with that in mind, we do have another Coffee with the Pastor scheduled for this next Sunday, March 28th at 930 in the morning. We'll meet via Zoom, so you'll need to bring your own coffee or, or tea or whatever beverage you prefer. And if you're interested, you can register online. You can find that registration information on our website, or you can reach out and contact Kim Halfhill. Next, there are several great opportunities coming up in the next few weeks, and I want to highlight just a few of those for you now. Our next Evensong worship service, which is the midweek portion of our Lenten Mindful Faith series, premieres this Wednesday, as it has every Wednesday, at 6.30 on Facebook and YouTube. Emmett Drumgoole has done a wonderful job shaping these services, so we hope you'll check them out and be blessed by them as well. And then, of course... Next Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, and there are some things that we know that you'll want to know about that. So I do hope you'll lean in and listen, because some of the details have changed. This coming Saturday, we're excited that our children's ministry, our deacons, and many of our other volunteers are able to offer our 2BC children a safe Easter egg hunt opportunity, which will take place at 10 o'clock a.m. at Scott and Sarah McConnell's farm. And to boot, we are still going to get to have cinnamon rolls, thanks to the very generous Carter family who will be making those homemade rolls for us. You have to reserve your rolls online, so please look for that information, and they will have take-out, take out, take home bags of cinnamon rolls, their famous cinnamon rolls, ready for you that day. Next, we'll have a virtual Good Friday service on Good Friday evening that we're doing in collaboration with Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church in Kansas City. This is the congregation we partner with for our Color of Compromise study that over 80 of us participated in and who we've been joining for their food share ministry over the past several months. We'll have a combined ensemble singing together. Um, leaders from both of our churches will offer readings and, and music. I'll lead us in communion. And Pastor Wallace Hartsfield will offer a Good Friday message. And I really hope you'll plan to join us for that. And then Easter Sunday. We hope you'll plan to join us for worship on Easter Sunday. And, and this is where the details have changed. We're trying to accommodate a lot of different needs, and hopefully we've called our last audible on this thing, but in this world we're living in, you never know. So, on Easter, we will have two services, 8.30 and 11 o'clock at the Belvoir Winery. Note, these are changes from previous communications you may have seen. We will worship at these two times in person, with the 8.30 service streaming on Facebook and, and YouTube at the same time for those who want to stay and worship at home. So spread the word. We're excited and we are ready to worship with you, to see you and to worship with you on Easter Sunday morning. And now, after these good words, a brief story that comes from a heavy heart. It flows from a conversation with a friend of mine who's a pastor whose dad was one of the over 530,000 people we've lost from COVID this past year. Now, that's an astounding number. But of course, sometimes if we haven't personally lost someone, we can insulate ourselves from feeling the weight and the impact of that number, that astounding number. And so it's helpful and even tenderizing 
to hear the story of one. So my friend and I got a chance to catch up a bit more this past week. And within that time, she shared a bit more about her dad's story with me. It started on a Sunday morning this past December. She was at her church preparing for their live stream service when she got a call letting her know that her dad, who had not been attending worship in person, was heading to church that day. With a worried mind and heart, she then called her dad and asked him to please not attend worship that day, but he said he was going anyway because he had volunteer responsibilities at the church. Now, of course, it's not always easy to pinpoint when and where, but the timing seems to align with that morning. Because when the amount of, within the amount of time, symptoms generally emerge, he had them, and it was COVID, and then very quickly after that, he died. Did your dad have any other health issues, I asked? No, he didn't. He was healthy, and she had envisioned him living with their family deep into his old age. But last December, he became a casualty of this pandemic. And you can imagine the mixture of grief and loss and anger. And friends, I have to say, that is why we have chosen as a church to navigate this pandemic the way that we have under the guidance of our task force. Because we didn't want to come to the other end of this thing and have any one of you say, if only my mother... If only my father, if only my sister, my brother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my child, my spouse, or my friend hadn't gone to church that day, we would still have them. Our task force has also made these decisions with the good of the greater community and world in mind. But, you know, it's strange. Sometimes the number one seems so much more impactful and powerful even than half a million. And we didn't want to lose even one of you. Now, agree or disagree, that has been our mentality as we've strived to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love all of our neighbors as ourselves this past year. And of course, we'll never actually know in this life how many lives may have been saved or not because of that. There's really not any way to measure it. We've simply done our best to be loving, thoughtful, and faithful. And in that spirit, we continue. By now, you should have seen that we're about to have many outdoor, in-person worship opportunities in April and May, and, and a few more virtual ones. And then we anticipate it won't be too much longer before we're worshiping in our building again, in, in our building again in some way. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. We thank you for your grace and your love along the way, just as we're grateful that you continue to join us each week in this way for worship. So now may these words we're about to sing together be centering for you. May they help us all to become more mindful of the God who is now and evermore always in our midst. We worship the living God together. and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead find the room for hope to enter find the frame where we are free clear the chaos and the clutter clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter be at peace and simply be silence is a friend who claims us cools the heat and slows the pace god it is who speaks 
speaks and names us, knows our being, touches space, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. In the Spirit let us travel, open to each other's pain. Let our lives and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming, there's a time for heart to care. In the Spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to one of our preschool classrooms at church. Many of you have learned a lot in this room, maybe about stories from the Bible with Mr. Charlie and Miss Loretta, or maybe counting by tens or learning sight words with Miss Carlene. Our brains are fascinating. We experience things all the time, but we don't necessarily remember or learn them unless they involve certain things. One of those is emotions or our feelings. If I asked you what you did on the morning of December 16th last year, you could take a guess at what you did, but you probably can't recall specific memories of what you did that morning. But if I asked you what you did on the morning of December 25th last year, maybe some memories come to mind of what pajamas you wore, a specific Christmas present you opened, or a special food you ate. That morning involved anticipation, excitement, and joy, so you remember it better. Another way things stay in our brains is because we practice them. Most of you know that two plus two equals four, or that tadpoles grow into frogs, that red mixed with yellow makes orange, or how to pedal and steer a bicycle. You probably know these things, not because of how you feel about them, but because you've watched or read about or practiced them over and over in different situations. Will you ever forget that tadpoles become frogs? Probably not. But what if, over the course of many years, you had experiences that made you question that? What if a friend told you one time that tadpoles are actually fish? It might make you wonder. And another time you watched a funny cartoon featuring pond animals and a character said that only tadpoles with spots will turn into frogs. You'd have some more doubts about what you learned about frogs. And then a few years later at a zoo, you're looking through some glass at unique frogs in an enclosure and you overhear another parent telling their child that baby frogs can hop within a few hours after hatching out of their eggs. By this point, you'd think that what you had first learned about tadpoles was wrong. And you might develop a new idea about frogs that's not really true. The same thing can happen with what we know about God. God's word tells us that God is creative and strong, that God knows everything and loves everyone, no matter what. But as we go through life, sometimes things happen that change our ideas. Maybe there was a year when I didn't have many friends. I felt lonely and sad a lot, and I thought God didn't notice or care. I might start to think God only cares for people who are popular. And then a few years later, I made a really bad decision. I felt terrible and was sure there was no way God would love me anymore. That might make me believe that God only loves people who make good choices all the time. 
Do you see how after a while I could start to believe things about God that really aren't true? But because I had those thoughts during times when I was emotional and because I kept thinking those untrue thoughts over and over in my head, pretty soon they started to seem true to me. As you get older and continue learning more about God, I hope you keep learning how amazing and forgiving and good God is. But you might have experiences when you could be tempted to start believing things about God that aren't true. Those temptations do not come from God. And that's another reason why working hard to feel close to God is so important. We've been talking the last few weeks about ways to work on growing closer to God through how we breathe and pray and go through our day and read the Bible. Another way we can grow closer to God, especially when we're going through an emotional time of worry or fear or feeling ashamed or sad, is to focus on one thing we know is true about God. If I'm sad or lonely, I can repeat to myself, God is here, God loves me. If I'm doubting God, I can remind myself over and over that God created the whole universe and yet God sees me. One thing that can help focus our thoughts is to hold an object while we pray. Some people hold a small cross or special string of beads while they pray to help them focus and feel near to God, but you could use anything. If you need to remember that God cares for everything in creation, including you, you could hold a little animal while you pray. If you feel tired or scared, like you can't do something on your own, hold a rock while you pray to help you remember that God gives you strength. If you need to remember that God knows and loves you when you're sad, then you could hold or even wrap yourself in a blanket that's special to you. This blanket isn't very cute, but my grandma made it for me when I was your age. And it has squares from fabric left over from things she made for me. So it could make me feel comfortable and loved when I pray. God just wants to spend time with you. And if it helps for you to hold a cross or a toy or any other object to help you focus as you pray, then do that. What are your feelings today? What do you need to repeat to yourself about God so you don't begin to think things that aren't true? Talk to God about it, even if it means praying with a rock or a toy frog. Serving communities as first responders is challenging under normal conditions. The worldwide pandemic certainly introduces extreme anxiety in our community, and it's especially evident among those serving as police officers, paramedics, EMTs, and firefighters. While contending with the impact of the pandemic, events of the past year has exposed, exposed extreme divisions in our country that has manifested itself in civil unrest in urban areas, including the Kansas City area. For the first time, police officers in our communities were asked to step up and assist the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department in confronting the civil disturbances, and they faced violence directed towards them, hate-filled rhetoric, and were challenged in ways they had never seen before. The early days of the pandemic brought in the anxiety that comes with facing a disease that could not only infect the individual first responders doing their duty, but it could also be easily carried home to their families before they even knew they were infected. Information being shared through social media was confusing, frightening, and many times enhanced their apprehension. When asked to offer suggestions on how our faith community can respond through prayer to support our first responders, I first thought of how the challenges they face impacts their families. Stress-related disorders impact the family as much or more than the individual. Praying for the physical and emotional well-being of our first responders and their families is very important. I would encourage prayers asking for the hand of God to protect them from both the physical and emotional threats they contend with and to instill a sense of comfort to each of them as they serve. I pray each first responder recommits to the concept of community service, as our community needs visible demonstration of confidence and reassurance from our government now. I think prayers from your for your local police department, fire department, emergency medical services organization, as well as any individual first responder you wish to live before God in prayer supports them. 
I pray our first responders place their faith in God and resist the fear that can impede their ability to do their hard work in challenging times. Thank you for considering these words, and may God bless you and your family. Will you pray with me? Loving God, redeeming spirit, we come this morning seeking a connection with something higher than ourselves, something we can now only see through a glass darkly, that we can only know in part. But while our senses and our knowledge may only encounter you in part, our heart and our soul can experience you fully. By your grace, we can feel your tangible presence as we experience it in our worship and in our lives. As the hymnist wrote, we stand amazed in your presence. Or, more likely, as we pass the anniversary of the beginning of quarantine, we sit on our couches eating breakfast in your presence. But this does not lessen our, or limit our amazement or our awe of your glory. For we remember the promise you have given us that one day, one day, we will see you face to face in all your splendor. This belief, this faith in your promises connects us to you and to each other, even when we feel isolated and alone. O oh God who created light and God who dwells with us in the darkness, we call on you as we pray for those in our community who are experiencing this light or this darkness. We lift up to you those in need of your healing touch, your comfort, and your peace in dealing with the shock of new diagnoses or the hardship of recovery. We pray for Diane, for Linda, for Rachel, for Hewlett, for Francis, for Christy, for Robin, for Janet, for Hannah, for Carol, for Dan, and for Susan. Help them to feel your soothing and calming spirit. We also thank you for the, for the blessing of new life as we celebrate with Brian and Jessica in the birth of their son, Louis John Shank. And we weep with those who have lost loved ones. We mourn deeply with Vonda and the death of Kaylee, and with Pat, the Fuller family, and the Greeson family, and the death of Dale. We grieve with Connie, Tom, and Luda, and the death of Lola, and with Jim and Lisa, the Shoemaker family, and Sally, and the death of Dan. In this time, we also lift up those who risk all for our safety, putting their lives on the line to allow us peace of mind. We pray specifically for those in our community who have willingly accepted their role as first responders as they work diligently to protect and care for each of us and all of us. We pray for their physical and emotional well-being, for your protection as they face dangers known and unknown. Help them to feel your strength and their commitment to keeping us safe and as healthy as we can be. We also lift up the families of these frontline workers as they experience the anxiety and fear that comes with loved ones putting themselves in harm's way. Be with them, give them your peace, and help them to endure the worry and the strife in this time. And finally, we pray constantly for those in our community, our nation, and our world whose lives are dominated by violence, racism, hatred, and oppression. We pray for your justice and fairness to roll down like a river as our world bends toward your light. 
All these things we ask in your name. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When my husband and I were in seminary the first time, we had this Christian history professor named Dr. Hansels. Dr. Hansels was from Sierra Leone. He had this really deep voice and he was raised in the British education system. So he had this thick British accent and an incredibly dry wit. He made jokes all the time, but we couldn't always tell and he rarely ever smiled. This man intimidated me to no end. We had heard that his class was tough, and on the very first day, he had us all look up and read aloud Ecclesiastes 1.18, which says, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And then he looked at us all and said, This is what you can expect from my class. <laughs> Terrifying. Dr. Hansel's invited all of his students to make appointments with him during his office hours, and I never went because, like I said, I was totally intimidated by the man, but, but my husband did. So Aaron walks into his office and sees a globe kind of like this one where Antarctica is facing up towards the ceiling and the North Pole is down here. So my husband kind of looks at it and the very first thing he says is, Dr. Hansel's, your globe is upside down. And Dr. Hansel says, <clears throat> is it? I'm sure we've all had moments kind of like that, moments where we've just heard something new for the first time or have just been faced with a perspective that maybe we've never considered before. It can be kind of jolting when the things that we've always known or the things that we think we've always known face a bit of a reckoning. It makes me think of those public service announcements that NBC used to air, that they'd always end with that sweet little tune and say, the more you know. Or it makes me think of those uh, G.I. Joe cartoons from the 80s that hopefully kids of the 80s and maybe even their parents remember, where at the end of every episode he would say, now you know, and knowing, I wanted to give you a moment to fill in the blank. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe. I love that phrase, but I'm beginning to realize that it's not true, especially when it comes to our spirituality. In fact, I'm beginning to realize that in the case of our spirituality, sometimes knowing actually causes the battle. With our spirituality, sometimes knowing causes the battle. But we'll talk more about that in just a second. Our sermon for today is called Unknowing to Know, and it comes from the chapter in Felina Hewitt's Mindful Silence book that talks about the contemplative practice of centering prayer. Jason assigned me this week to preach, and my first thought upon hearing unknowing to know was that I don't even know what that means. So if you're in the same boat, just stick with me for a little bit. Our verses for today, the ones that Emmett just read, are three short little verses that are couched in the first half of the Gospel of John, where Jesus tells a crowd that if any of them are thirsty, they should come to him and drink, and that for those who believe in him, they will have rivers of living water that flow from their hearts. And John, as the narrator, then tells the readers that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, who at this point has not yet come to indwell all believers. So Jesus says, come to me and drink because rivers of living water are in all who believe, which means that one of the ways that we can come to Jesus to drink is by connecting to those living waters that are within us the presence of God that dwells in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. We can look inward 
to come to Christ, to connect with God. And centering prayer is one of the best ways that I know to do this. But before we can get into centering prayer, I want to talk about this idea of knowing and unknowing. It's difficult to dissect because the concept of knowing is so nuanced. We can know someone or know about them, and those are two different things. We can have knowledge, like in the form of information or education, And we can know something because of the society or the culture in which we live. Like the ways we just know that this is how things work, even if it was never explicitly taught to us or stated in that way. Much of the ways that we know, much of this knowledge is actually good and really beneficial to us. But I want to echo back to what I said before, which is that sometimes in the case of spirituality, knowing can actually cause the battle. Sometimes what we know actually hinders our ability to grow in our relationship with God. It hinders our ability to, as we've been talking about all season, take on the mind of Christ. The first time I remember this happening to me, where knowing actually caused a battle in my spirituality, was when I felt called to the ministry. Specifically, when I felt called to preach or when I felt called to be a pastor. But at that time, I thought that God didn't call women to do this. So when I told my friends, my college classmates, that I felt like God had placed this calling on my life, guys and girls alike responded with, "Mm, but, but God doesn't do that. God doesn't call women to be pastors. And my first response back then, because I was still trying to reconcile it myself, when they would say this to me, the first thing out of my mouth was, I know, I know God doesn't do this. So I had no idea what to do. In my case, what I knew theologically collided with what I knew I heard the Spirit say to me. And it caused what Peter Inns, a biblical scholar, calls an uh uh-oh moment. He says that most Christians have these uh uh-oh moments that threaten our familiar ways of believing and thinking about God, and that these moments get our attention like nothing else can. But he goes on to say that he thinks these uh uh-oh moments are actually holy moments because they break down the religious systems that we create for ourselves that ultimately block us from questioning or wondering and thus connecting more deeply with God. I've also heard of people who experience these uh uh-oh moments on like mission trips or community outreach work. The first time my husband visited Haiti with Jenny Jenkins, which by the way is a trip that's coming up for Second Baptist folk this September if anybody's interested, he was jolted and really saddened by the disparity that he saw between how they live there and how we live here. He came home and started asking questions like, How can we say that God provides when there are people who have tarps for walls and no food to eat? When one of the poorest countries in the world without many resources or much solid infrastructure gets hit by a massive hurricane and throws an already impoverished country into deeper chaos, how can we say that God is in control of that? How can we say that God is love and God is just? My uh uh-oh moment came because I knew theologically something that contradicted what I heard the Spirit say. His uh uh-oh moment came because what he had certainty with regard to who God was and how God worked in this world rubbed up against a real life experience and a new awareness. Both were like that upside down globe that made us think about things in ways that we never have before. Although I'm sure we could name more, more experiences, more types of knowing. There's one more type of knowing that I want to specifically mention here before we talk about centering prayer. But this knowing is a bit more difficult to articulate. I would describe this last type of knowing as ingrained knowing, something that is a fixture about who we are and how we think. Ingrained knowledge includes those things that we believe are true because somewhere along the way, they just kind of got stuck in our psyche. Maybe this is from society or from a parent or from something that we were taught. We can have this ingrained knowing about ourselves or about others or about the world. 
But today I wanna to talk about how the ingrained knowing we have about ourselves can be a hindrance to our spirituality. And here's the first example. Our culture values productivity. We are constantly moving, constantly on the go. It's almost a, sat, a status symbol if you can tell people how busy you are. Many other countries actually think that we're workaholics. But I know many people, and I have one friend in particular, who has it so ingrained in her that she must be productive that she can't stop moving even to sit down and eat dinner with her kids. She is very active in church, constantly volunteering to help with so many different things, but she struggles to pray because she feels like she's not doing anything when she prays. It is ingrained in her that her productivity directly impacts her worth. And I wonder what her life would look like if she knew that God's love for her was not dependent on that. I also once told a group of teenage boys that God didn't just love them, but that God actually liked them too. And they immediately argued with me. They said that they all know God loves them. Like, of course, God loves them, but that they also know that God is disappointed in them for all the ways that they mess up, much like their parents are. And I asked them, how often do you think that God is disappointed in you? And they kind of looked at each other and went, pretty much all the time. And I know many adults who feel the same way. Like God is never really happy with them. And I wonder what would our lives be like if we knew that God looks at us like a proud, happy parent instead of a disappointed parent. Brene Brown, who I hope most of you have heard of, talks a lot about shame. She says that shame is an unspoken ep epidemic, the secret behind many forms of our broken behavior. She says, shame is that gremlin that says that we're never good enough. Or if we can finally ignore that part, shame says, who do you think you are? Shame gets ingrained in us, sometimes from an incredibly young age. And often the voice of shame feels so much louder than the voice of God. Sometimes we can confuse the voice of shame with the voice of God. And we begin to believe that God looks at us and thinks about us like our shame does. All of these types of knowing, the uh-oh moments, the certainties, the ingrained knowledge, the shame, they can actually keep us from really knowing God. We think we understand who God is or how God relates to us in this world, but that knowledge may actually be coming from all sorts of different outside sources and may or may not be accurate. And over time, it builds a barrier between us and God. I visualize it kind of like this, as a layers of knowing that build up and block us from experiencing the goodness and the freedom and the deep, deep love that God has for us. And sometimes I think we have the capacity to realize what's hindering us. We have the understanding and the ability to say, okay, I think this, and I know that's not the voice of God. I know that's just my shame or that's something in me that's making me believe this thing. But sometimes though, we don't even realize what things we know that have become stumbling blocks for us that are, that are hindering our spiritual growth. Either way, whether we know or whether we don't, this is where centering prayer can really change our lives. In a very general sense, the idea of centering prayer is to get alone and silent with God, to clear out the words we say and the thoughts we think, and to simply sit and be present with God. And what happens when we do this is that rather than pull on outside sources to understand God, we're trying to forget everything we know. We're practicing unknowing, if you will, and we're letting God reveal God's self to us from the inside out. Remember that Jesus tells us that the rivers of living water, the spirit of God, flows from within all of those who believe in him. So it makes complete sense then that we can sit alone and do nothing with God and that the Spirit of God can be moving and working within us. Sometimes we may be able to point to that work. We can say, wow, the centering prayer practice has really helped me feel this or, or I feel like God revealed this to me while I was praying. 
Other times, though, we maybe can't pinpoint anything. But we can trust that God, who is always present with us, is doing the work in us, is doing the work for us. It's kind of like an ocean. The surface of an ocean rarely indicates all of the movement that's happening underneath it. Whether we can pinpoint that deep stirring in us or not, we can still trust that it's happening. And one of the things that happens with or without our conscious knowledge is that those layers of knowing that we've built up start to slowly peel back. That as we sit there and let God work from within us, God will slowly start to open our eyes to the layers and we'll start removing them. As we get silent in our voices and our thoughts and let God work within us, we are practicing unknowing those outside sources, unknowing our theology, unknowing our certainty, unknowing the voice of shame, unknowing anything else that has been put on us and learning to know God from within, God on God's own terms. Thomas Keating, who is known as the father of centering prayer, says that this incredible thing happens in centering prayer because since we've cleared out our thoughts, we aren't actually thinking about God. And this, mean that, this means that God now has the space to manifest on God's own terms, that God can just be himself within us. And that one of the things we'll discover at its deepest and truest level, the thing worth knowing more than anything else is worth knowing, is that we are loved by this God. That God's entire being is love for us. And at the core of how God views us is not about correct doctrine and it's not about productivity or what we've done good or what we've done bad. It's that we are so deeply, truly loved. And let me add this, whether you are a complete novice at centering prayer or whether you've been doing it for years, there's always more for us to unknow. And there's always more of God for us to know. So let's never make the mistake of thinking that we've arrived, that we don't need this anymore. So we're going to take a moment to practice centering prayer right now. Most contemplatives say to practice centering prayer for 20 minutes once a day. I'm relatively new to centering prayer myself, so I started actually working a few weeks ago and I started with five minutes a few times a week. And now, three weeks later, I'm still at five minutes a few times a week. But for me, that's still growth. Today, we're going to practice it for two minutes. Before we begin, you can think of a word or an image that can act as your centering word or image during the prayer. The idea is to quiet your thoughts and to not be thinking about anything, but if you find that your thoughts have wondered, you can call to mind that centering word or image, let it recenter your mind back to, you know, clarity, back to clearing it out, and then continue with the prayer practice. What we're going to do is we'll have soft music playing in the background and we're going to have a slide on the screen. And if you're able, if you're in a quiet spot where you can do this with us now, which I'm fully aware that some of you may not be, I invite you to sit in a comfortable position with your eyes closed and try to sit quietly with God in centering prayer. Remember right now, you aren't offering anything to God. You aren't doing anything for God. You're simply sitting and being present with God. And that's enough. So we'll practice these two minutes of centering prayer. And then Chip will bring us back with our hymn of response.
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. is my daily prayer. Your very word spoken to me. And I I'm desperate for you. personnel committee would like to give our church a quick update regarding Jason's upcoming sabbatical. And that's a little bit of a funny word, upcoming. It could mean next month. It doesn't, but it actually used to. So I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, members of the personnel committee are Lisa Shoemaker, Scott Lakin, Steve Trishler, Pat Kuhn, and Adam Kankowitz. As most of you know, our church has long had a sabbatical policy, and had, it has proven beneficial over the years to our ministers and, and also, of course, to our congregation. And 2021 is Jason's sabbatical year, and the final plan for that con uh, was approved by the congregation way back in the old days, January 2020, and that plan was to start in April, hence my next month comment, April 2021. This is a unique sabbatical. As a reminder, uh, after an extensive application process that involved work by a number of our church members, Jason was awarded a literal once in a lifetime, meaning you can't get it twice, grant from the Lilly Endowment. And the grant is substantial. It provides $40,000 for approved sabbatical expenses that meet all the criteria, and $10,000 for the church during the pastor's absence. 
And among the stipulations with the grant is that the 2021 sabbatical must be in consecutive months, meaning can't spread it out or split it up. The grant recommends four months, which is what the church approved back in January of 2020. And that's the plan that was to start next month. And then, of course, as the pandemic began to play out months ago, we wisely moved the sabbatical back to late summer or early fall of this year, since surely things would have been back to normal in plenty of time by then. Which brings us to today. Jason and the personnel committee have had extensive conversations and we recognize the importance of his being a part of our church's eventual coming back together for in-person activities, which it now appears could very well overlap the revised, revised sabbatical timing. So last month, the personnel committee approved moving Jason sabbatical a second time to the spring summer timeframe for 2022, if the Lilly Foundation will allow this exception, which we anticipate that they will. And so this is basically almost, well, a little more than one year later than was originally planned. So we wanted you to know about that. While the 2022 timing has different implications for our church operations, our committee believes strongly that these concerns are outweighed by the need for Jason to be visible and intangible leadership throughout the balance of 2021 during those important months for our church. So this second revision to the original plan allows the church and Jason to still benefit from this amazing sabbatical opportunity and in the timing that, at least at the moment, seems best suited to the needs of our church family. Friends, I am grateful that I got to be with you this morning. Whether you were able to practice centering prayer with us or whether you're going to need to practice at a different time, I'd like to leave us all with this. May the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take delight in your living. And may the one who sends you send you now in joy. For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you is the one who keeps you still. Amen.